Liberal Senator and former Ambassador to Israel, Dave Sharma, joins me live now from Taipei. Dave, good to see you. Has it been a successful uh, visit and how, how do you rate or mark success? Well, look, I think it's been an important and useful visit. I think we've had um, a very high level of contact with the administration here in Taiwan, including with opposition lawmakers and the incoming government. Taiwan is about to go through a change of administration in May. I think we've delivered some important messages about Australia's commitment to the region, Australia's support for stability across the Taiwan Strait and maintenance of the status quo, and, of course, Australian condolences for the loss of life in the wake of this terrible earthquake in Taiwan. Often when you see a delegation like this, particularly from the US, you draw the ire of, of China and Xi Jinping. Have you seen any of that reaction so far? No, I haven't seen it. Um, and I would say, I think, if, if we did get that sort of reaction, it, uh, I don't think we'd take it particularly seriously. I mean, this is a normal sort of an interaction between uh, lawmakers from both sides of the aisle in the Australian Parliament with counterparts in Taiwan, uh, these sorts of visits are a regular feature of our relations with Taiwan. And it's important that we make sure that these sorts of things continue. This doesn't change, um, as I've said before, this, this isn't not Australia supporting a change in the status quo. It's not an alteration in our one China policy or anything else like that. It's not a, a change in the status of our diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Mm. But it's an important level of interaction with the Taiwanese, which it's very important that we continue to maintain. And we should be public and open about it as well. We don't need to be, you know, uh, hiding these visits away or pretending that they're not happening. No, but you have just been there telling uh, Taiwanese officials how they should and can build up their defences uh, without naming that that is surely directed at China. China, I uh, assume wouldn't well, appreciate think, uh, that kind of advice. Well, our, our, what we are interested in hearing about is the level of Taiwanese military preparedness for any number of contingencies uh, in the region. Now, I think our view, certainly my view, is that the high level of um, military preparedness in Taiwan will in fact be a stabilising factor across the Taiwan Strait because mm. it will discourage adventurism, it will discourage unilateral alterations to the status quo. I mean, you know, we just heard before in your report, you know, Beijing has reacted angrily to, um, well, continues to react angrily to the AUKUS project, for instance, but that is not changing Australia's mind about the importance of that capability, which inherently we see as a stabilising factor as well in the Indo-Pacific. OK, let's talk about another part of the world, and that is uh, the Israel-Gaza war, which continues to raise, rage on. We had a speech by Penny Wong uh, earlier this week that has been roundly criticised. But I ask you, is it a massive departure from, from uh, current policy? I think with the timing and the setting, it was incredibly reckless. I mean, if you think about the context here, yeah, if you're Ismail Haniyeh sitting in Doha, Qatar, you can't believe your luck. I mean, six months after the worst terrorist attack inflicted on Israel, suddenly you're seemingly getting a change in Australian policy. Australia, which had previously been very firmly committed to uh, a two-state solution coming about only after negotiations between the party, is suddenly dangling the prospect of unilateral recognition. You have to chalk that up as a win to Hamas. And you've also got the situation where... Australia is not particularly critical of Hamas's conduct of this conflict, its continued commission of war crimes, but we've appointed a very senior uh, former member of the ADF, a mm. former chief of the Defence Force, to probe Israel's conduct of this. I mean, if you're the Hamas leadership, uh, and this is the problem with Penny Wong's speech, if you're the Hamas leadership, you are only taking encouragement right now from what Australia is saying and doing. And if we want to bring about an end to this conflict, we need to be not encouraging Hamas, we need to be discouraging Hamas, mm. we need to be persuading them that conflict is futile, that they're not going to gain anything on the battlefield or on the diplomatic realm by their continued holding of hostages. That's, that's the problem with Penny Wong's speech here. But aren't you overstating the role that Australia can actually have in the thinking of Hamas and the ending of this war? Well, look, I'm, I'm not going to overstate Australia's role, but clearly a position like this, a change in this position, you know, we're not the major actor yeah. in the Middle East, but this is going to be noticed in Doha, it's going to be noticed in Riyadh, it's going to be noticed in Ramallah, it's going to be noticed in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Um, and we are an important factor in the Middle East. I mean, you know, we've had a long-standing commitment to that region. We've been yeah. one of Israel's strongest and earliest and most bipartisan supporters. You know, this change of position has consequences. 
But is it a big change in foreign policy or is it just, as you say, the, the timing of when the speech was made and how it's been elevated? Well, I, look, I noticed that Anthony Albanese and Penny Wong have been crab walking away from her speech during the course of the week and said, oh, look, we were just commenting on what's happening around the world. But let me be very clear, unilateral recognition of a state of Palestine before such a state is established, before final boundaries are negotiated, before we have a Palestinian entity committed to coexistence alongside Israel, Mm. Unilateral recognition of a state of Palestine before any of that takes place is a massive change in I policy. I don't know whether this matters, Dave. I don't know. I don't, I don't, no, but I don't know whether this matters. But wasn't the operative there word there being could, not that they would, that you know, in in circumstances that were amenable, well, the yeah, but, I mean, I, could. I, 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 yeah, but I'd, I'd ask the question: Why are you engaging in hypotheticals? I mean, if you're an officer of a Minister of the Crown, uh, holding where words matter, as we're always hearing from Penny Wong. Why are you going around speculating about these sorts of things? Of course she intended to get this to the headline, and of course she intended people to draw that conclusion, um, and I think it was highly irresponsible. Do you think a two-state solution is, is dead now? I look, I don't think it's dead, but I think we need to be realistic about how and when it can be resurrected. Obviously, you know, there's, there's been a huge loss of trust between um, the Israelis and the Palestinian people. That goes back, you know, almost two decades now since the outbreak of the Second Intifada. But it's been, you know, vastly widened, that, that gulf in trust by uh, Hamas's war. So I don't think we should pretend that it's all very simple and we just need to draw some lines on a map and force the sides to agree. That's not going to happen because peace ultimately comes about when there's a level of trust between peoples. And that's what yeah. we need to focus on rebuilding. Now, I think there's still hope to resurrect a, a regional type of peace effort. I mean, the Saudis are still interested in normalisation with Israel, uh, and they would want to see advancement of the Palestinian national cause as part of that. But we need to think about what are the steps that will rebuild trust in the Israeli side to make the territorial compromises necessary for a two-state solution, mm. but also what we can do on the Palestinian side to encourage a political leadership and a public opinion that supports coexistence with Israel rather than being committed to the extermination of Israel. And th these are not yeah. tasks that can be done within a year or two, to be honest with you. They're pretty patient, uh, long-term, difficult tasks. And if, look, if a two-state solution was easy, it would have happened by now. Yeah, in the previous couple of decades, I don't think October 7 um, expedited any of that. Uh, Dave Sharma, we always need more time yeah. <laughs> to discuss these issues. But thank you. I appreciate it. Safe travel home.